We are joined by Chris Ballas of the Wolverine. And Chris, you've been watching some very dominant football of late. We have not talked a lot about Michigan here on the show because basically because of the quality of their opponents, but you know, Minnesota is not a bad team and they go in there and just absolutely demolish the Gophers. PJ Flex says that's the best coach team that he thinks he's ever played against. And I mean, they, it does feel like this Michigan team keeps getting better, but I'm curious and, you know, having watched the, the 21 team that won the big 10 and made the playoff 22 team won the big 10 and made the playoff. Where does this team stack up relative to those two? Yeah, it's a great question. And actually, PJ Flex said he thought it was the best team that he'd seen. Oh, best team, period. Know. That's right. Yeah, That's and right. Which, yeah. And that caught our attention. You know, he's not really prone to hyperbole when it comes to talking about opponents. But, you know, I would say this team's deeper, Andy. And if you look at them with the star power they have at quarterback and and running back, Donovan Edwards hasn't even found a gear yet. He's not even averaging four yards of carry uh, against the big teams. So um, they still have room to improve. But now you're starting to see – on the, on the lines, the lines starting to come together. And now that Jim Harbaugh is back, I think they took it personally, Stapes, and, and said that, okay, we're going to go on the road against that number one defense in Nebraska that everybody's talking about. We're going to make a statement, which they did. But then to go to Minnesota like they did, uh, Mason Graham, a sophomore defensive tackle, absolutely dominated in that game. Minnesota moved the ball, but they make adjustments. They kind of squeeze the life out of you. Like Flex said, it's like a boa constrictor, and you can see it. Uh, they just do what they do so well, and you're starting to see it with Jim Harbaugh back now that, okay, they're starting to click on all cylinders, and you're starting to see a little panic, for example, in the Buckeye fans and stuff like that as we approach the end of the season there. Well, it's, it seems very similar to me to the, the 2021 Georgia team that they lost to in the Orange Bowl. They are acting a lot like that team. The, the Mason Graham thing was, was crazy this past yeah. weekend because he's coming back off an injury and missed a couple games, but just – absolutely showed out with his first chance back. And the, the depth is, is amazing to me because it feels like they just kind of finally figured out what their offensive line should be. Yes. Maybe in game, what game four, was it the Rutgers game or was it the Nebraska game where they really figured out what the combination should be? Yeah, it was Nebraska. Ladarius Henderson at left tackle and he's starting to pass block better. And that was really the key. They needed somebody over there that could that could pass block. And they found him uh, and moved Carson Barnhart back to right tackle and really, really seemed to have something going there. So, but, you know, the difference between Michigan and Georgia in the past has always been the line play, the defensive line, maybe uh, you saw Georgia's defensive line completely overwhelm Michigan in the in the bowl game a couple of years ago. And you're thinking, OK, that's what we still need to see from Michigan to get to that level. Now you've got guys like Chris Jenkins. You've got guys like Mason Graham, Kenneth Grant that are SEC type defensive linemen that are really doing the job and lead you to believe that Michigan can compete with those teams now. So, you know, they still don't have the, the elite receivers, right? If you look mm -hmm. at, there's no Marvin Harrison, you've got Roman Wilson who's coming on, but uh, how's he going to do against better defensive backs? Is he going to be able to get off the line? Those are things that still need to be proven. But when you've got an elite tight end like Colston Loveland and you got a quarterback like JJ McCarthy that can keep plays alive and do some things with your, with his feet, you know what, you can combat that as well. Well, and that's what it feels like. It feels like JJ is, sort of the X factor here because in the Harbaugh era, they have not had a quarterback like this where he, he has the arm, the mobility. And I, I kind of wonder is the end of last season where we got to see him really kind of break out because it seemed like they were maybe, I don't know if keeping him under wraps was the right way to put it. They just didn't need him. But yeah. now that they know what he can do in these earlier games, when they, maybe they still don't need him to do any Superman type stuff, they're just sort of testing out ways that they might be able to use him when the Penn State game comes, when the Ohio State game comes. Yeah, they need him a little more just because teams are, are stacking up against the run against them a little bit better. You know, they aren't going to let Michigan run for 300 or 400 yards on them like they did last year. And maybe Michigan can. And what, one thing Jim Harbaugh said about that, he said, you look around college football and the rushing numbers just aren't where they were. And he said that wasn't normal, what we did the last couple of years. And he's right. You're not seeing teams always breaking off. 50, 60 yard runs like we saw from Donovan Edwards and Blake Corum. So now you need JJ McCarthy to keep on that read option a little bit more. And we saw him do that a couple of times. We saw him do it against Nebraska. We saw him do it against Minnesota. He does it just enough to keep teams honest. And now you got another back too in Kalel Mullings, a big back who has really emerged and is getting those tough yards and short yardage situations. But yeah, they're opening it up a little bit more, running a lot more play action, Andy. 
on first and second down when teams are coming up to the line of scrimmage and putting more responsibility on McCarthy. But for the one game against Bowling Green, which was an anomaly, he's handled it perfectly. And they, they've got Indiana this week. That's a game they should easily win. Michigan State, obviously, is an important rivalry game, but not what it has been because of, of what Michigan State's dealing with in their own situation. How do they keep them this consistent? Is it is it the competition at practice? You talked about the depth. I'm wondering, is, is that what is keeping Michigan playing so sharp, even if the opponents aren't really inspiring them? Yeah, because guys want to play. And if they understand if they have a couple bad plays, there's a guy behind them that's going in that's going to be able to play and and take their place. So uh, Jim Harbaugh and, and people I talked to said they had the best week of his week uh, days of practice all fall on Tuesday and Wednesday of last week. So they're still motivated and they, they're still really climbing. But, you know, the schedule is so bad. It really is. This is it feels like the 1970s all over again. We're dominating <laughs> teams and they're going to make up for that next year, Andy. But uh, but it's hard really to say until they get to Penn State, right? And Michigan State played hard against Iowa. I don't want to just say, hey, right. Michigan's going to roll in there. At least they showed some life. But that's a game they should win handily. And really, it's a three-game season. You don't know what you're going to get from Maryland sandwiched in between there. They are capable of some good things like we saw against Ohio State, but they also implode. But it's really a three-game season to determine uh, what this team is going to be able to do in the postseason. It's crazy. And, and the Big Ten – it, it, it wasn't the ideal time to be announcing the 2024 opponents when they did last week, but they had to do it because they had right. to change the schedule around. And you look at Michigan's schedule. They already had Texas scheduled, but then now you're going to get Oregon, USC, and Washington added into the schedule. So different from this year. It'll be fun. But let's yeah. let's talk about Michigan in the future and and you know in the grand scheme because you – you reported last week that a, a Jim Harbaugh contract extension was imminent, not necessarily going to wait till the end of the NCAA stuff. And I'm curious about what that means long term for Michigan. So how, first of all, how have those discussions been going and why did it finally get to the point where they're going to do it? Yeah, well, Jim, you know, it's boiling up and, and we've been hearing for, for months, you know, hey, where's my contract? I don't like being the fourth highest paid coach in the Big Ten, nor should he, you know, and he was starting to tell more and more people in his inner circle and, and it gets around a little bit to the point where it, it kind of forced their hand. And you wonder why it took so long, frankly. This is a guy who has been at the pinnacle of, of football in the NFL, in the NCAA, and they can use the NCAA investigation and allegations, you know, to say as an excuse to say, well, we want to see what the result of that. It's not going to make a difference as to whether or not you extend a, his contract. So he should be the highest paid coach in the Big Ten. They know what there are some people in the administration that went to the president and said, we need to get this done. Jim wants it done. So uh, that's why it's going to happen now. And, and the way we understand it and reported it, and it has been since been reported by others since, is that they basically got a month to get this thing done. They want it done within a month. Now, does that guarantee he's going to sign it, Andy? That's the, the interesting part here, number one. Number two, does it mean that he's not going to go to the NFL at the end of the year or in January and February if they call? I don't think that's the case at all. I still think he'll listen. And that's why we watched teams like Las Vegas uh, play right. last night and the Los Angeles Chargers and stuff like that. And speaking to one of his friends, Andy, they said, you know, I think Jim loves it at Michigan, but I also think he wants two Lombardis to John Harbaugh's one. If it comes to that. <laughs> so. Well, and that's the thing. It, he may have his best Michigan team right now. Yeah. And, the, and the way the NFL schedule works, he'd be done with Michigan this year before that has to be decided. So it's not like one of those things where – if you're angling for another college job, you've got to make that decision in December. That's not the case. He, he would have time to, to work it out. And that was my question was, yeah. if if they give him this and he signs this, does that put to rest the NFL stuff? And that's what I was wondering, you know, because you're going to have possibly the Raiders, the Chargers, maybe the Bears, and the yeah. Bears maybe getting maybe in position to get Caleb Williams, which is something that any coach who works with quarterbacks would probably enjoy dealing with. Although... J.J. McCarthy's draft eligible too, so let's he not is. forget that. But that is that is the part that, that I was curious about, but also the NCAA part of it because it does feel like if Michigan does go through and give him the extension, it does tell the NCAA, we don't care what you do yeah. in this case. He's our guy. Yeah, and nor should they if you look at things. You, know, you look at Kansas and Bill Self and you know people that thumb their nose 
this is not Michigan thumbing their nose at anybody. This is Michigan saying, you know what, we believe in our guy. You know, maybe he made some mistakes and, uh, you know, a lot of people think it was overblown. You know, yeah, it was more about more than just about a burger, but it was about, you know, a legal contact or whatever. But in, in the grand scheme and compared to what goes out there on out there in college football, uh, pretty light frankly. And it was really the, the untruthfulness about it that got him in more trouble than the act itself. So allegedly. So, but yeah, uh, he's got uh, relationships with the bears where he played uh, Las Vegas. The Raiders are an organization that he got his first coaching job with. And uh, you know, when he was actually buying for a quarterback coaching job at Michigan, got passed up, ends up with the Raiders and loves that franchise. So there are things to watch and anybody who professes to know exactly what Jim Harbaugh is thinking on a daily basis you know, I know his, people in his inner circle say it changes all the time. You know, he loves yeah. it at Michigan. There's no question about it. His dad lives right next door to him and his family's right there and, and his kids are in school where he went to school. He loves it. But man, there's that itch. And he admitted it, you know, when the with the Minnesota thing a couple of years ago. Hey, if it had worked out, I'd have taken the job. But uh, Michigan was lucky to get him for a couple more years after that. Well, and he is the ultimate wild card. It, he said something on Monday that I, I found interesting, and I wanted to run by you to get the kind of context of it. Sure. We talked about the contract extension has been a, a three and a half year thing. Is that a reference to to getting his pay cut? After the 2020 season. I think so. Absolutely. He was pissed flat out. Anybody can say whatever they want to. He took that hard and, uh, you know, told people in his inner circle, you know, man. And then you would assume, right, when you come back and you win back to back titles and, and you've got Michigan at the pinnacle again, that they're going to rectify that and say, hey, you're our guy. You're the, the best coach in college football, one of the best. And we want you here forever. And it's been a slower process than many expected, especially him. So uh, these guys have egos. They all do. I don't think it's a pejorative to say that. It's what makes him so great. And Jim Harbaugh is no different than anybody else. So I think you nailed it there. And, uh, you know, he and A.D. Ward Manuel don't have a warm, fuzzy relationship. And I think that was a big part of it, getting the pay cut. So but there are other people at Michigan, too, that understand his importance to the university that are going to make sure that this gets done, including President Santa Ono. Well, and the other thing about this is he's a different coach than he was in mm -hmm. that situation. And, and before that, he was good before that, but he wasn't this good. Right. What changed? What is it that, that changed post-pandemic? That has allowed them to do this because we talked about the the depth, the talent. It's not it's not just that they're recruiting better, but they're developing better. You know, if you talk about who has the most NFL prospects on one team going into to this year, it's them. It's not yeah. Georgia, and that is a, a big change. So, how did that change? Yeah, it's a great question, and uh, you know, I've, I I was watching. Green Bay last night, I was watching Rashawn Gary, who never really, he was a five-star kid, never really lived up to that billing as the number one player overall when he was here. And then you look at a three-star kid like Mason Graham and just absolutely dominating. Uh, you had guys that, uh, I'm not saying they're going to say that they didn't play hard at Michigan, but they really, you know, they kind of, you viewed as, as a stepping stone. And uh, after 2000, after the after the COVID season, you had a group of kids like Ronnie Bell and those guys that told these guys, hey, if you're not all in, we don't want you here. We need to get back to everybody wanting to win for Michigan. And I don't think that was the case. And, and I think Jim Harbaugh, too, kind of learned, had to learn again how to be a college coach compared to the NFL. He kind of treated it like an NFL franchise, according to some people on the inside. He brought NFL coaches with him, right? Uh, not all these guys were great recruiters. Now you've got Mike Hart there on staff, a former Michigan legend. You've got Ron Bellamy, who played receiver here. Mike Elston on the defensive line, who really understand the culture. And everything's kind of come back to when Jim Harbaugh played and, you know, that whole culture of Bo Schembechler and you're starting to feel it. And they got their identity back. You know, they went to the speed and space and they were kind of throwing stuff against the wall. Jim Harbaugh, I think, kind of doubted himself for a little while there when he couldn't beat Ohio State. And it turned out all it took was a really good defense and a couple of great coordinators <laughs> to change that thing and uh, get him back to where they wanted to be. Yeah, you cover those crossing routes and all of a sudden everything changes. Right. And, and don't. Yeah, exactly. Not with a guy who runs a 4.7 or 4.840, you know. Exactly. So, yeah. So what do they, I realize it, this is really nitpicking at this point because they've been so good and mm -hmm. so consistent across the board. What can they be better at between now and the Penn State game that would help them go to State College and win that game? 
Yeah, you know, they still need to run the ball a little bit better, in my opinion. They still have too many inefficient runs, as they call them, zero to three yards. Now they're getting better, and I don't think it's any coincidence that it's getting better with Jim Harbaugh on the sidelines there. But uh, I think they were bored, Andy, in those first few games. Uh, I don't think there's any question about it. Nebraska got their attention. But I would like to see some of those backs uh, make a few more guys miss there and turn those seven-yard gains into 40s. Uh, we saw one against the Minnesota, but Donovan Edwards is better than he's shown. Uh, we'd like to see him break loose a little bit. Uh, the receivers still, you know, they're still not getting open a lot. Even against Nebraska, uh, J.J. McCarthy had to put some balls on the money. There wasn't a whole lot of separation there. You'd like to see a little bit more of that. But again, the way he extends plays, uh, his receivers now, compared to a couple of years ago, are, are keeping plays alive by moving with him. So that's getting better. But they don't have those game breakers. I'd like to see more of that. But other than that, man, they're just bleeding teams to death. And uh, that is one heck of a way to win. You feel helpless, and you can kind of sense it in Minnesota in the second half of that game. We'll see what happens at Penn State. You know, that's a team with better athletes. and But uh, I, I suspect Michigan's going to go in there with the same formula. Can't wait for that game, man. It's hard to believe we have to wait a month, you know? I know, I know. <laughs> and that's that's the strangest thing about this season and the way, you know, this particular Michigan non-conference schedule, because they didn't have that marquee game in there which would have maybe given us a little better idea maybe given people a lot more to to think about now it's like you basically cram the two biggest games into the final three weeks of the season yeah. and <laughs> hope that works hope everything you know hope everybody's healthy hope everything works out but it does seem like they are on track to be the best they've been under Jim Harbaugh when they hit that stretch. Yeah, and given the state of college football now, there's not one team where you look at and say, okay, although Georgia did play better and looked really good against Kentucky, where you're saying, okay, uh, they can't beat these guys or they're going to have a really hard time beating these guys. They could be right there with anybody. So this is about as good an opportunity as you're going to have, right, uh, considering what they might lose next year. We know they lose Blake Corum, J.J. McCarthy. Uh, still talk that he might want to come back for a senior year, believe it or not. But hey, uh, NIL, but, Caleb Williams might come back too. Yeah, exactly. He was talking about playing for Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, and Harbaugh, by the way, did talk about Caleb Williams yesterday at his press conference. That was fascinating too. <laughs> so, conspiracy theorists unite. Oh, you know? is it? Well, listen, Jim Harbaugh's a smart guy. He knows what he's doing. Yes, he come does. Come on, he's light, lighting the fuse there. Yeah, so. he was fantastic. But um, yeah, so you know what? We'll get down there and, and that's when we'll find out. And what'll be fascinating is if these three teams beat each other and then it comes down to a tiebreaker about how their West opponents played. So now you got to root for Minnesota if you're Michigan. You got to root for uh, Nebraska. So you're in there watching Nebraska and Illinois on Friday night and, you know, saying go, go, Huskers, got the corn on your head and everything else. W wouldn't that be the Crazy. ultimate way to kill off the Big Ten West? Right. Where that Iowa team that is just god awful. Yeah. But if they beat Wisconsin, they probably will win the Big Ten West. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Might be what lifts Penn State to it. Exactly. Can yeah. You imagine? It's crazy. But you know what? I'm, I'm glad those days are gone. And for anybody who doesn't like expansion, just look at this year and then look at. I remember the feeling when Florida State would come to the big house and Miami of Florida. And, yeah. and it was such a great way to start the year. Beats the crap out of playing UNLV with all due respect to the running Rebels. Yeah. You know? I, I know they don't fondly recall the last time Oregon went to the big house, well, but yeah. I am much more excited about next year's matchup absolutely. than I am about about that one back then so absolutely and it's better you know what they get most of them at home with the exception of Washington can't wait to go out there that's a great road trip isn't it oh yeah I mean yeah. it's a, well, maybe the most beautiful setting in college football right right, right there on Lake Washington and, yep. and we're, we're gonna see it this weekend when Washington plays Oregon it'll be the the featured game of the weekend <laughs> meanwhile big noon Saturday is Indiana Michigan uh, that's Woo! the whole country <laughs> getting that one and and going Boy, this, this yeah. first quarter was very interesting, but I'm going to tune to something else, I think. <laughs> exactly. 34 and a half point favorite, and it's supposed, but it's supposed to be 50 in rain. So, you know, who knows? In a conference game. That's wild. Yeah. It's yeah I, I don't know that I'd pick Michigan to cover in that weather, but it is it is truly amazing to see how different they are. It, it was hard about bringing that up, that three and a half year thing that made me think back to, to everything that, that they've dealt with since the pandemic like yeah. if we'd have told you during that pandemic season that in 2023 they will look like the best team in college football what would you have said no way i, I thought you know what this, this thing is reeling uh, in fact when after they got hammered by wisconsin at home 
I had coaches, former coaches texted me saying, this is a broken culture. They're not going to be able to fix this. And I was right there. But then he made some great hires and these kids, to their credit, turned it around. And I do think that the the salary cut really lit a fire under him, Andy. I do. And I think, you know, for as, as mad as that made him, I think it made him a better coach and got him refocused again. So, but I never would have believed it. And, uh, but to their credit, they've done a great job identifying recruits and developing that talent. They've got an unbelievable strength coach in Ben Herbert, who has helped put it all together and an amazing coaching staff. Jesse Minner is going to be probably an NFL coordinator next year somewhere. Mm -hmm. Andy, I mean, he was interviewed by the Eagles and uh, Mike McDonald's with the Ravens. So, uh, but they've got it working. And if you're a Michigan fan, you say to the administration, do whatever you can to keep this thing together, because that's Michigan's hope going forward here in this NIL era is to keep Jim Harbaugh here for another 10 years and keep it rolling. Well, he got his pay cut. Now he's going to have the option to have about as much money as he wants. Yep. We'll see if he signs it. Yeah, we will. <laughs> and that's, that's what I love about him. He is the ultimate wild card. Chris yeah. Ballas, thank you so much. Anytime, Andy. Thanks for having me, brother. Thank you so much for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe to this channel right here so you never miss an episode of Andy Staples on 3. And oh, by the way, watch all the other great videos on the On3Sports YouTube channel.